Freddie, um, I got to be honest with you, though, Mickey. You're one of the most positive dudes I know. Yeah. And I know we're going to talk a lot of Titans football, but I'm going to need you today, man. I'm going to need you. Your Twitter turned kind of dark on I'm, Sunday. I am. I, You're a positive guy, but I you look like a guy who was tweeting wise, oh, almost a man. broken spirit. For the for the guy who's driving the uh, the fan bus and and living with every two tone blue. Uh, up and down it's it was a rough go for me <laughs> Sunday morning and it was early too right we got the 8 30 kickoff yep. which really started the day off uh you know in a negative aspect but hey that's why I'm here with you and I know you're gonna lift me out of it but I can't wait to talk about it and uh hopefully there's a lot more hopefully we went into that dip and get a little bit more upswing here on the way out of this buy uh I, I don't know if I have that kind of power I I, I don't know I, I want to start with this, though, because I, if you don't know Mark, if you're new to Nashville, Mark was a, a, a Titan and a Bear and then a Titan again in his career and was a, a, a Pro Bowl return man. So we certainly need to talk about the return game today and what the Titans are seeing, especially from the punt return game. But when this offseason played out, there was this national narrative, this is a rebuild. You know, all the national writers, every national writer just kind of, oh, well, the Titans are rebuilding, so off to the next team and and, and when we were watching around here, it's like, I mean, you still have Derrick Henry and you still have Ryan Tannehill. To me, that doesn't feel like a rebuild, even though you're changing 40-something percent of the team around them. It feels like you're maybe trying to make one last run at it. And then they get D-hop, and I'm telling myself, like, why would you get him if it's a rebuild? Why in the world would you spend that kind of yeah. money for a veteran like that? And Big Jeff got paid, and, you know, Bayard took his pay cut, but he didn't leave. And so I started kind of convincing myself, like, well, maybe they got a little something. They're going to put some duct tape on there. They're going to try to hold this thing together, see where it can land one more time. Well, so far it has crash landed Eesh. one more time. As you were watching things, what was your impression of what they were doing? Well, first of all, when you say rebuild, it slides off the tongue so you know so easily. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know who it's easy for is you know or easy or easier for are you know the front office and ownership who who have a, a you know a future and longevity. Well, who it's really hard for are the guys in the locker room and the coaches and the guys going to work every single day. I don't know a lot of alpha alpha males and competitive dudes inside of a locker room that would be okay with signing up for a rebuild. Yeah. Um, you know, this early in the season or in the off season or whatever it may be, the national narrative always sort of, you know, puts the Titans in the backseat, which is fine. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think sitting here as a Monday morning quarterback and, and, and being a fan now and, you know, having to watch it from the sidelines a lot of things were positive. I felt I felt good about a, a lot of things going into the season. I feel like we were headed in the, back in the right direction, and all those things, and this defense, and D Hop, and and uh, Traylon, and some of these guys mm -hmm. that were going to take the next step, which we could talk more about. Um, but I think the biggest issue and the biggest elephant in the room, especially on the offensive side of the ball, that we talked about and we hammered and we've relelessly beat this horse is this offensive line. Two and years. Not just before Not, this season, yeah. but also before last season. Yeah, and so a lot of what we can c complain about and, you know, a lot of the Derrick Henry production and a lot of the Tannehill stuff, the roots of this problem go back to this offensive line. And we knew it. Are, I think you're seeing the results of a couple, two, three, four years of pretty mediocre draft picks and with this roster. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I mean, you're being kind. I mean, we could get where we could get more into, you know, deeper into it, but <clears throat> it's, it's very, it was very hard and frustrating for me. And it has been to watch this offense. I think Tim Kelly, um, what I like about him is he's not, he's not so predictable. Uh, he is mixing it up, but I'll tell you, I'm so sick and tired of watching these tight splits and these tight formations and all these dudes. I mean, I don't know. Again, Monday morning quarterback. I'd have to sit down with him and ask him. I don't understand some of the stuff we're doing on offense. Um, and I think it, it really gets highlighted because we have five offensive linemen who can't win man-to-man -man consistently on every single play. We're losing the battle at the point of attack every play. And you're watching Derrick Henry get... 12 to 15 one to two yard runs a game 
and it's just it's just massively crippling our offense when you go first and ten to second and nine or second and ten. Um, and then, you know, his, his stats will look okay because like on Sunday you can rip off a 65 yarder and, and all that. But the, but in reality, it's just a limiting snickets, a series of unfortunate events. It's just one guy making a mistake after another, the lack of discipline. And it's, it's, it's frustrating to watch. Um, I'm sure it's frustrating to coach. They're probably sitting in there as we talked, as we saw coach Rabe's, uh, talking post game, but they're probably sitting in there trying to fix it, trying to figure it out. But you know, I, I took a couple screenshots and some sh- I could show you some stuff. But Derrick Henry continues to run downhill into these eight and nine man boxes with nothing but mud. You can't see anything. Yeah. And we, you know, uh, we can get into this more again. But we started off the game first first play from scrimmage in eleven personnel and spread. And there was the most beautiful, majestic six-man box you've ever seen. <laughs> and I mean, it was just—it was like I, I swear I stopped it and framed it and just stared at it. You know, Six there was four people. down, yeah. yeah, four down linemen and two backers. And I thought, oh my goodness, gravy! That is the most beautiful thing that Derrick Henry's ever seen. He goes and bre- and he fell forward for eight, I think it was, and he shouldn't have gotten tripped up, mm. but he might have been out the gate, and we never went back to it. We never went back to it until the third quarter. We go back. We uh, we broke off uh, Tajay Spears, who's been one of the biggest highlights mm-hmm. on offense this year, breaks off a 10, 12 yarder, and then Derek breaks off another 10 yarder, but we spread it out a little bit. And I think for me, seeing play after play, I'll give you an example for Tennessee fans, okay? And we're going to talk Vols as well today. Yeah, coming up next, even with. Mark Heim of AL.com. Yeah, so what the Tennessee, this is for Tennessee Titans and Tennessee Vols fans. You're going to understand this analogy. And I know it's college to pro. Don't, you know, I, I understand that and there's a huge difference. But the Tennessee Volunteers, they spread the formation basically mm-hmm. to, from sideline to sideline. And I mean, Hypel will get up to the line of scrimmage just to see what's going on and not even be ready to snap the ball. Mm-hmm. It's to make the defense declare what they're doing. The defense has to show you what they're doing. They are now having to guard. They're having to defend the field vertically Mm -hmm. and horizontally. And all it does is create space. So much space in between. It it declares your matchups. The receiver knows who's guarding him. The linemen know their targets. All this stuff. And not to mention, if you put 11 personnel in the field, which is one tight end, one running back, and th- three wide receivers, a little bit lighter package, mm-hmm. you got less run stuffers. So instead of putting Derrick Henry in these crammed boxes, I would love to see them implement some of that volunteer, the, the Tennessee Vol offense where we spread it out. Don't treat him like he's Eddie George or Jerome Bettis or Mike Allstott who's just going to blow a hole open. Spread it out. And let him get into some green grass and some open field. That's when he's the most dangerous. And we just haven't done it. And I'm sitting there breaking down the film this morning again. And I'm just watching play after play after play of our heavy formations. Or excuse me, heavy personnel groups. Mm -hmm. Tight formations with tight splits. And all that does is compress everybody into the middle of the field. Mm -hmm. Including the defense. And it just makes it a complete mess. If you're on the goal line, Mickey, and you're on the one yard line. What formation you're running. You're tying it down. You're putting big butts out there. And you're going to try to run it at somebody. Because all you need is one to two yards. Right. Well, we're doing that on first and ten on the 25-yard <laughs> line. With, the, with a guy who should have been a perennial MVP candidate. I mean, it is so hard to watch him run the ball for one to two yards and get hit in the backfield. It, nobody knows their targets. All the defensive linemen have to do is stunt or run a game or, or cross interior on the on the in the a gap and it blows up everything because everything is so compressed if you go back and look at what what the the running plays that had success against the ravens you are going to see spread out and 11 or 12 personnel but spread out guys with that create space uh horizontally and i don't know why we can't get to that i don't know why we can't get back to that and it, it is for it is gotten frustrating to watch for a guy who lives and dies by two-tone blue every Sunday. You know what's crazy? And I don't know if you even remember this. You hung out with me probably four or five days total all of last season. We're blaming us out. You came in and did the show, and we were hanging out. Do you remember you said this same thing last year? 
Do it's, you remember this? I do we remember. We had a lengthy segment where you said, I have to bring something up. I want to talk about these tight splits. I I totally but, remember. So you have We've a, been watching this. So you have a different OC who was on the staff last year. Rabel, they all talk about, we self-scout. We self-scout. So you had a whole offseason to self-scout and a different guy calling the plays. Yep. And they're doing the same thing that frustrated you. And for people who don't know, your your day job was wide receiver. You were a kick returner. So, again, if you're new, you don't know who Mark is. This is an NFL veteran, seven-year guy, receiver talking. Is it strange to you that you would switch out the OC, self-scout for a whole year, and then do a lot of the same stuff? Well, what's all – yeah, I, I think it's, it's outrageous. And that's why it's getting so frustrating. And I just – I look at it and I just – you know, I'll never get this opportunity, but – I just want to say, I want to ask Tim Kelly, what is the, what is the mindset there? What is the strategy? Why is it so tight? Because if it was tight like that, in my recollection of playing offense, now you have the outside the hashes all, all wide open, right? You've compressed everything. So there's a lot of green grass. But ha- have you seen a 10-yard out thrown? Do we go run that speed out ever? Uh, no. So we don't take advantage of that green grass. They like, tried one time, and Tannehill got hit as he was throwing. Him. Well, that goes back to the off. Yeah, there's a lot of Tannehill getting hit, and we got to give him his due credit for his toughness. But I, I, I mean, I, if you're going to self scout and you're watching the last few weeks, you need to go look at the run plays that have had success. And I hate the. It doesn't have to be uh, um, Derrick Henry taking the snap. It doesn't have to be you know all this ra- razzle dazzle, but. When it ha- when you have had success, it's when you're moving in motion and and you got you got um, Tajay Spears and Derek in the backfield at the same time and you're faking and you got th- giving the defense something to think about. When we st- when we get to the line of scrimmage and run vanilla inside outside zone, we get absolutely hammered. <laughs> and I mean, I'll tell you, I if you listen to me spew nonsense here for a while, you'll know that I love bringing this up. But Mike Malarkey said it in a way, and I don't know if you remember, but before D- Derrick Henry was here, DeMarco Murray was the uh, won the rushing title for and the, the AFC. the AFC, sure did. Yeah, so they knew how to, and, and what Mike Exotic Malarkey, smash mouth. The exotic smash mouth. <laughs> it is a physical style of football, but you are drawing up plays that you expect these runs to hit for big plays. Mm-hmm. There are There's no room in this offense, in our lack of consistent offense, for one and two yard rushes. We can't do it. We can't sustain it. We can't sustain drives. We're one of the worst team on the, in the league in third down and in red zone because we get behind the sticks because we have negative rushing plays over and over and over again. It's hard. It's hard to watch. And I mean, if you're I don't in think the group I'm chat, you feel any better? Now. Well, I was just gonna say, if you're in the group <laughs> chat right now, or if you're on the phones, I need a little. I need a little positivity in my life because we're. I came on here looking for some for uh, for some optimism, and I'm spiraling here. Okay, okay. I'm spiraling. I need some help. Mark is spiraling. Uh.